day dharma service at the Wan Dharma Center. This morning we'll engage in silent sitting meditation, sutra chanting, prayer meditation. And today we are lucky to have our guest speaker from the Wan Institute of Graduate, Graduate Studies, Reverend Grace Song. So she'll give us a Dharma talk. Let us begin our gathering with yoga stretching with Karen. So please rise and stand. Stand in front of your mat, in front of your mat. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. So let's find some softness behind our knees and step the feet a little wider than the hips. And we'll just connect to the breath here. So we'll take a nice big inhale and reach the arms up overhead, bringing the breath all the way into the body and then exhale, just allow the arms to glide back down again. We'll do that one more time. And if you'd like, you can drop into your knees and inhale, lengthen the side body. Exhale, just allow the arms to float back down. We'll take the right arm and reach it up. And then we'll take the left arm up and the right arm down. We're just going to go from side to side, lengthening the side body. And you can drop the hips from side to side if you like. Just really become aware of the opening of the side body. Connecting again to your breath. Inhaling and exhaling. Beautiful. And then go ahead and bring your hands to your hips and separate your feet wider. We'll go ahead and hands together in front of the heart again. Inhale, arms come up. And on the exhale, we're going to drop down into that left knee, bending that knee, and just drop the seat as much as you possibly can, extending that right leg out to the side. Inhale, come back up again, and we'll go to the other side. Dropping into that right knee, big stretch on the inside of that left thigh. Inhale, up again, one more time on each side. Inhale, up, pressing into the floor. Exhale, dropping down. And then coming up into your cactus pose. Actually, it's goddess pose, cactus arms. Toes come out a little bit. We're going to open the knees nice and wide and drop down. See if you can look at your big toes here. That means really drawing the knees back. Breathe into the, <laughs> into the legs. Breathe into the chest. Inhale, exhale. Coming back up again. Release the arms. We're going to turn towards the right. So the, le the right toes come out. We're going to intersect the heel of the right foot with the arch of the back foot. We'll bend the front knee, look over the front hand, make sure your knee is directly above your ankle. And then we're going to come back again to center, back into your goddess pose, and come up and over to the other side. So looking over the opposite arm, connecting to your breath. Come back up again, back into your goddess pose. Take a breath here. Inhale up, <laughs> over to the other side. Now this time, let's bring the back hand to the back leg. Turn the front palm up. Reach all the way up and across the ear. Breathe in, breathe out. Coming forward now, bringing the elbow to the knee. And the back arm comes alongside the ear. Trying not to collapse that top shoulder forward, but opening up the heart and smile. <laughs> Inhale, come back up again. Back into your, your goddess pose. See if you can go a little lower. You really are squeezing the glutes, dropping the tailbone. Coming back up again to the other side. Left toes out, right toes in. Bending the front knee. 
take a breath here. And then back hand comes to back leg, front arm comes up, reach across the ear and back. Big side opening here. Coming forward, elbow to knee. Trying not to collapse into that knee, but rather stay light there if you can. Inhale, come back up again. One last time in your goddess pose. Coming as low as you possibly can. Inhale up. Release the arms and heel toe or hop your feet back together again. Hip distance apart. So we'll step the right foot forward, left foot back. Make sure you're standing on a train track this time. So your feet are definitely hip distance apart, not one behind the other. And then bring the hands behind you, interlace the fingers, or just reach for your wrist, roll the shoulders back and down. Inhale, lift the heart as you drop the hands. Exhale, hinge forward here, leading from the hip crease. So that's leading from here, rather than the waist. Straight back, soften the front knee, and fold over that leg as much as feels comfortable to you. Try to let the weight of the head go. Keep drawing that right hip slightly back and that left hip slightly forward. Makes a difference. A lot of sensation behind the legs, especially the leg that's in front. And then press into your feet and lift yourself back up again. Release the hands, step the feet back. Take a moment here to catch your breath. This time step the left foot forward, right foot back. Again, on your train tracks. Now you can interlace again or reach for your wrist, or if you interlace, just try to put the opposite fingers on top. Sounds a little confusing. <laughs> Whatever feels right. Roll the shoulders back. Plug that big toe, the front foot, into the floor. Big inhale and exhale. Hinge forward at the hip crease. So the back is nice and straight here. You're drawing that left hip slightly back, run right hip slightly forward, and you're letting the full weight of your head go. Breathing in, breathing out. And push into the floor with your feet. Inhale yourself back up again. Release the hands. Step the feet side by side. Let's go ahead and bring our hands to our hips. Roll the shoulders back and then bring the hands behind you so the fingertips are down and gently press the hips forward. Now try not to look straight up at the ceiling unless that actually feels good for your neck. Otherwise, just look where the wall meets the ceiling. You're broadening at the chest here from shoulder to shoulder. Big opening here. And you can look down at the floor if that feels better. Just breathe into the front body. Now inhale, coming gently up to neutral. You're going to take a nice big bend in the knees and just walk the fingertips down the legs as you fold over the legs with a round spine. Again, dropping the head but lifting the tailbone. So we're not trying to push the knees back. We're simply lifting the tailbone and that will increase the sensation or the stretch behind the legs. Take the right foot, or rather the right hand to the floor, fingertips, and then twist open, bending that right knee, twist open towards the windows. Big stretch. And then come back down again, left fingertips to the floor, bending the left knee and twist the other way. Big stretch. Coming back down, bend the knees quite a bit. Bring your hands to your knees, bring yourself up. Engage the glutes, strong legs, and we'll end with a breath of joy. So the breath of joy <laughs> is three short inhales followed by one long exhale where you fold over the legs. So I'm a little tangled here. <laughs> Hands in front of the heart center, softness in your knees. And then we, it's almost like conducting an orchestra. So you take your fingertips and begin to conduct. 
And then a big exhale, soft knees, fold over the legs. And then you begin to come up again with the inhales. And then one long exhale all the way over the legs. We'll do this again. And exhale. And this time stay here, but try to get soft in the body, soft in the legs, soft in the neck. Again, we're not forcing the knees back. We're just lifting the tailbone. And then engage your abdominal muscles so you're using those as well. And just slowly, slowly, slowly stack your vertebra one at a time to come to stand. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. We'll stand, remain in standing to greet our Buddha in this Dharma hall. Where is the Buddha? Where do you see our Buddha here? Yes. <laughs> this is our Buddha called Iron Sang, which means one circle image. And this is uh, our true mind and the ultimate truth of the universe. That's what this Iron Sang Buddha symbolizes. So with your palms together, with your minds and hearts together, please join me in bowing practice and standing posture. I bow in gratitude to the grace of heaven and earth, honoring the infinite beneficence of nature and the universe. I bow in gratitude to the grace of parents, honoring the beneficence from parents, ancestors, and all those who have had a nurturing role in my life. I bow in gratitude to the grace of fellow beings, recognizing the truth of interconnectedness. I bow in gratitude to the grace of laws, which guides us, protects us, and promotes justice. Now turn to your living Buddhas next to each other, and we will greet each other with smiles. Now you may be seated. In this space today, we have 26 folks from the journaling retreat that we had over the past four days. So welcome everyone. And now we'll practice sitting meditation. with the guidance of how to sit, how to enjoy our silent meditation better. This morning, Pete Won Sung Yong will lead the method of seated meditation. The method of sitting meditation is simple and easy. Sit comfortably on the floor or in a chair, breathe in, Grab all your tension and breathe it out. Open up your chest and heart. Stretch up tall and align your spine from your neck to your tailbone. Relax your shoulders and arms, then allow your hands to rest on your knees. Bring your attention to your breath. As you exhale, Release all mental and physical tension. Invite your attention to abide in your chi energy field, which is called Tanjan. This is located about two inches below your navel and is the power center for your breathing. <coughs> 
Open your eyes and gaze downward over the end of your nose and to the floor. Keep your mouth closed and allow the tip of your tongue to rest gently against the roof of your mouth. When your mind is concentrated and calm, pure and clear saliva may gather in the mouth. You may swallow it. Relax your facial muscles and notice your gentle smile. If your face or body begins to itch, do not scratch. This is just a sign of the energy circulating in your body. Simply note the itching and let it pass. If your legs ache unbearably, you may change position very slowly and quietly so that you maintain a still calmness and do not interrupt others. When thoughts arise in your mind, do not be discouraged or disturbed by them. Simply focus on your breathing without reacting to or playing with those thoughts. Recognize them as thoughts. They will disappear by themselves. And remember, keep bringing your awareness back to your Danjan Breathing Center. continue practicing meditation for a long period of time, you will rest in the realm of samadhi, deep meditation, in which the mind is calm, concentrated, perfectly focused, and at peace, with no distinction between self and others, time and place. We are grateful to sit quietly together, finding the still point within. May we be here now, aware of our ever calm and alert spirit.
when it comes to meditation there are many forms please join us now in prayer and sutra chanting meditation page three page three spiritual chant young jun and praise. Let's keep reading. I wish and pray, sincerely and truly, 
when my hands touch the world, when my feet walk on the ground, when my voice echoes through the hills, they were. That we all together, all together, share a true affinity for attaining great enlightenment and for helping all living beings. Page four. And five. One song
some stretching with our arms, shoulders, our upper body as you raise up your arms high. Find a spot that you need to stretch a little further. Today we have guest speaker from our school, one institute of gra graduate studies, Reverend Grace Song. She is the chair person in one Buddhist studies in that school. So today she is going to give us a Dharma talk entitled Embracing Inquiry. Please join your palms together. Let us welcome Reverend Grace. So from the moment we are born in this world, curiosity is part of our nature. If you observe any infant, they are natural born explorers. They're scientists. Notice how their eyes sparkle at the sound of something new or the sight of a shiny object hanging above them. They may not be able to utter the question why, but their eager hands will instinctively reach out wanting to feel and discover what's in front of them. As a child, I have vivid memories of my mother. She's a, an artist, a fine artist. So she would have these huge canvases and she would do these paintings with acrylics and I would just sit behind her and just observe her as she did her paintings. And then one day she started to blend in reds and orange, oranges into the sky and I was horrified. I was like, what are you doing? Because in my paintings, the sky was always blue with just white clouds. That was my world. So the question was, why is she doing that? And then she encouraged, she's like, come over, why don't you do it? And I was like, no. Okay. Why? We are born to ask questions. And I remember watching this one video. It was a very short clip called When Holding Hands with My Father. And it was a story of an old man and his son. And a white-haired old man with dementia looked out the window and asked his son, hey, what type of bird is that? It's a magpie, dad. And after nodding his head, the father asked again a little later, hey, what type of bird is that? <sighs> I told you it's a magpie. And after looking out the window, father repeats the same words. Hey, what type of bird did you say it was again? How many times do I have to answer for you to understand? It's a magpie. And at that moment, listening from the side, mother sighed and spoke, son, when you were young, you asked a hundred times what bird that was. Dad, what bird is that? That's a magpie. Magpie? Dad, wait, what bird is that again? That's a magpie, son. And each time, father would answer, it's a magpie repeatedly. And that's how you were able to learn to speak. Inquiry is the fundamental aspect of being human. 
And when founding master Swetisan incorporated this teaching into the scriptures, it was as if he offered a guiding hand. Questioning means wanting to discover and know what we do not know about human affairs and universal principles, which is the motive force that reveals what we are ignorant of when we try to accomplish anything. So this wisdom is like a supportive presence guiding us through our journey of discovery. Because Master Suttisan understands the experience of undertaking a spiritual journey alone, to spend years without anyone to turn to for questions or guidance. So what did he do? He asked questions to himself, gazing at the sky, asking, that sky is high and vast. How did it get so clean? How does the wind and clouds arise unexpectedly from such a clean sky? And he spent years climbing a mountain, praying to the mountain gods for guidance to answer his questions and searching for a mentor to resolve his ex existential doubts. And yet he found himself solitary, contemplating deeply by a riverbank, wrestling with the question, what shall I do with this one doubt? And it was through this deep contemplation that he entered a state of deep meditation, losing all consciousness, ultimately attaining great enlightenment. So ultimately all his questions were resolved, but his physical state had deteriorated. His illness had grown increasingly worse, but he had no choice because he didn't know the road. There was nothing else he could do at the time. Master Suttisan was driven by that deep question, a longing to investigate, to know what's true. He wanted to come home to the living truth because it is this that sets us free. When we ask questions, we start to reveal the truth of who we are. So Master Suttisan advises, do not harm your body and engage in ascetic practices. You don't have to retreat to the mountains or endure long nights outdoors. You don't have to spend the whole day sitting on a road or stay up all night with your eyes open. You don't have to bathe in icy water, fast, or stay in a cold room. So before his passing, he devoted his nights to revising the scriptures. His dedication aimed to guide us so we could achieve Buddhahood without resorting to extreme ascetic practices. He didn't want to compromise our health. He didn't ask us to leave our family or livelihood. So just like a parent desires their child's happiness and well-being, Master Suttasan wished for everyone to lead lives filled with joy, good health, purpose, empowering us to reach our fullest potential. So why did he emphasize the importance of inquiry? Because the act of inquiry is deeply embedded in our nature and it drives us toward enlightenment. Second head Dharma master Chong San emphasized that true questioning begins with strong faith. As faith underpins every action we take, whether it's waking up, eating, driving, there is an inherent trust involved. Trust that, that, that this food will, will sustain me. Trust that our vehicle will take us to where we want to go. Trust in this context is another way to describe faith. However, in spiritual practice, faith alone isn't sufficient. Without the willingness to question, faith can harden into unwavering certainty, leading to dogmatism and a sense of self-righteousness. Simply memorizing texts without engaging in thoughtful examination can become a dead practice. Great faith without great inquiry will not lead to great awakening. Belief will get you started on the path, but we will forget. It's only through awakening that we truly remember and understand. So years ago, I studied with a one Buddhist elder in Korea, and we would meet several times a week and she could always tell when I didn't study. So she sometimes say, you didn't study this week, did you? 
And I'm like, how did you know? She goes, because you don't have any questions. And she said to me, she said, without inquiry, the teachings will never become your own. She said, if you simply take what I say at face value, without questioning, reflecting on it yourself, then the teachings are mine, they're not yours. So her message was clear. Teachings only transform into personal wisdom when actively questioned and internalized. Master Sotasan explains that inquiry within one Buddhism differs from traditional practices because uh, in some traditions, there are monks that spend hours on the cushion deeply contemplating what we call a koan, a paradoxical question. And although this form of intensive meditation is part of our one Buddhist practice, it's just a small portion. The kind of inquiry that Master Sutta was encouraging is one that's woven into the fabric of our everyday lives. And why is that? It's because we do not live in isolation. We live together in homes, in workplaces, in classrooms. Our interactions with others as well as with the world around us serve as constant opportunities for learning and growth. Life itself with all its complexities and connections becomes our true training ground. So Sutta once lamented, who among you has discovered a scripture that can be read over and over again without end? If people look at this world in the right spirit, there will be nothing in it that is not scripture. Generally speaking, what we call scripture explains the two aspects of human affairs and universal principles. Scripture guides us to choose the right direction in our lives and to follow the way of humanity. However, human affairs and universal principles do not derive from the written word. Rather, the whole world is, in fact, human affairs and universal principles. The sky, the earth, and everything around us form the basis of our life. Each has its own intelligent principle. And there are days when I follow these principles and days when I don't. When my body and mind are in sync with principle, I experience benefit. And when they aren't, Many times I suffer harm. So it's akin to learning how to use a digital device. Any digital system operates according to a set of rules. If I understand how the device works and how to use it properly, I will be able to enjoy the many advantages it has to offer. However, no matter how sophisticated my smartphone is, if I don't understand how it works, I won't be able to get the most out of it. They say that before the mind awakens, all we see is the physical sky and earth. After waking, we clearly see the principle that moves the sky and earth. So what qualities do principles have that allow them to manifest in so many different ways? They are known as the great, small, being and non-being in one Buddhism. These aspects don't operate in isolation, they interact in harmony. So the great encompasses the holistic view, the essence of all things, understanding that everything is interconnected. The small looks at the individual components that make up the whole. And these parts aren't static, they go through changes of being and non-being, just like the change in seasons, just like birth, aging, illness, and death. So I remember this one time, I was changing, I guess it was, it was um, from summer to fall, so I was changing my clothes, I was moving the summer clothes out, bringing the winter clothes in, and I accidentally slammed the closet door on my left finger, and I said, ow. And then something interesting happened, I had this out of body experience, where the closet door slammed on my finger, on my left finger, and immediately my right hand, without thinking, grabbed my left finger like this. And I was like, oh my gosh, you're such a compassionate right hand. <laughs> like it was audible, I'm like, oh my gosh, good girl, looking after your left hand sibling. 
And as soon as the right hand grabbed this finger, my fing this finger started to feel a bit better. The throbbing started to subside. And it just came to this realization, wow, left hand, right hand, they may seem like separate, but they are one, right? They are one. Just like the relationship between a parent and a child, they are one. So when one suffers, so does the other. When one is happy, so is the other. So people ask me, Grace, why do you have faith in one Buddhism? And I share that it's very simple, that I witnessed my father, who does is not here today, but I saw him change through the practice. And I remember in high school, I went through a very uh, rebellious stage for many years. This was um, from middle school to high school. And it you know, this meant that I went out with my friends and I c came home very, very late, I should say early morning, and it was always the same pattern. So I would come home late, so it'd be two or three in the morning, and then our house was such that if you walked in, there's a couch right there. And so what happens, my dad would be waiting there like, all the time. And of course, I'd, I, would, I would be sp that fear before entering, and then the moment I entered, he'd be sitting there like, in the dark, which is scary, right? And then the moment I walked in, he would start screaming, of course, because he's worried. And this happened over and over again. And then this one day I remember, this is so clear in my memory, it was in high school, again, probably two or three in the morning, coming in, and then my expectation is he's gonna scream. Then I came in, so he was sitting there, and he's, but he's silent, which is like as <laughs> scary. <laughs> it's like probably more scary. He was silent, he sat there, and then we made eye contact. But instead of screaming, he went upstairs. And I was like, yes, yes. <laughs> so I thought, okay, he's angry, but he's not gonna shout, so, so I slept. And then the next morning at breakfast, and then he screamed at me. <laughs> but I remember, what was the difference? Where, why was there this shift? There's there because that was there's this disruption in that pattern, it stuck in my memory. And the difference was before when he got angry the minute I walked in, there was a tr transfer of a lot of anger and worry and stress and anxiety, and I felt that. But the next this time it was the next morning, he was a lot more calm. And so what transferred most was his concern and the lesson that he wanted to impart to me. Did I change right away? Of course not. However, I feel that those moments planted seeds. And I almost think that those seeds are the shift from you know, wearing tight club clothes to wearing these nice loose Buddhist robes. <laughs> yeah. So there's this underlying principle, great, small, being, and non-being, interconnectedness, impermanence. And our scriptures clearly give us our the direction for this practice of inquiry. But our third head Dharma master, Tezan, he said the external practice of learning through observation, listening, and asking questions. So what I admire most about many of our sages is their capacity to maintain a beginner's mind. Even though they are teachers, they are perpetual learners. So we have our fourth head Dharma Master Chasan. And whenever I'm in his presence, whenever someone comes who is ex an expert in a certain area that he's not familiar with, he's constantly asking questions, eager to learn. Because he understands that questions can allow a person to escape the prison of, of what they think they know. Master Tesan also said the second practice of inquiry is contemplation. So the information you gather by observing, by listening, don't merely collect it, but reflect upon it. Through reflection, your thoughts become organized, leading to a precise understanding. So the method that he talked about, Master Tesan, is rolling the thoughts, right? Until we attain the power of wisdom. And we practice this because it is more comfortable for most of us to stick to our biases. But what happens if we roll something we start to examine a situation from various angles. So just imagine you have your own business 
you know, instead of just s thinking about its success, you roll it to say, okay, what happens if there's a, if a, if there's a failure? What's my contingency plan, right? And you roll it again. The strategy might be good for me, but how does it affect others? It might be beneficial to me, but what about its impact on the broader community? Or perhaps you're organizing an annual event, rolling it again. The approach would be to think about how we are we going to enhance this year's gathering? What steps can we take to make the event better than last year? Rolling the thoughts is also beneficial in navigating challenging relationships. We, we start to understand that the world is not divided into just good and bad people, but rather it is made up of all manners of individuals, each caught up in a common human struggle, each having the capacity to do both terrible and beautiful things. And we start to become more tolerant and accepting of others' shortcomings, and the world appears less dissonant, less isolating, and less threatening. We also grow that compassion. We can look with curiosity at people who do not share our values. So the more we look and listen, the more interesting they can become. And finally, sometimes contemplation requires just to sit and live the questions. So poet Rainer Maria Rilke once wrote, be patient with all that is unresolved in your heart. He said, try to love the questions themselves as though they were locked rooms or books written in a very foreign language. And he said, don't try to reach for the answers which could not be given to you now because you would not be able to live them. Just live the questions now. Then perhaps then someday far in the future, you will gradually, without even noticing it, live your way into the answers. So sometimes inquiry just requires patience. We sit with the question for a very long time without an answer, and then at some point you may have that aha moment. So today I invite us to all be like a child again, unafraid to ask questions, open to listening and learning. Let this world be our living scripture, our training ground to enlightenment. It's amazing that we sit here today in this human body to be filled with light and to shine. And a Buddhist story tells us, suppose there is a blind turtle who lives in the bottom of the vast ocean and the turtle has a long life and it comes up to the surface of the sea only once in a hundred years. And now picture a single log floating on this immense ocean with a hole just the right size for the turtle's neck. The chance of this turtle poking its head through the hole in the log during one of its rare visits to the surface is incredibly slim. According to a Buddhist story, being born as a human is even more unlikely than the turtle's rare success. This tale highlights the preciousness of this human life. So founding master Sotesan established the spiritual teaching and now it's our turn, it's our role to embrace it, to practice it, to make it our own and pass it on to the future generations. And may we be comforted to know that the spirit of Sotesan and all the sages before us are holding our hands as we learn to live the questions themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Grace. Thank you for your teaching. She's a great Dharma teacher. Not only that, she is a great storyteller. I always enjoyed how she shared her stories from her childhood up until <laughs> this moment. Thank you again. Um, speaking of questioning mind, that's one of the important the element in one Buddhism studies and also that's what we encourage you to embrace questioning mind we welcome you to bring your questions to us for now let us read 
the essential dharmas of daily practice and to see what questions we can bring, take with me today. Page six. Kathy will guide us to this reading. The essential dharmas of daily practice. One, the mind is originally free from disturbance, but disturbances arise in response to sensory conditions. Let us restore the equanimity of our true nature by letting go of disturbances. Two, the mind is originally free from delusion, but delusions arise in response to sensory conditions. Let us restore the wisdom of our true nature by letting go of delusions. Three, the mind is originally free from wrongdoing, but wrongdoings arise in response to sensory conditions. Let us restore the precepts of our true nature by letting go of wrongdoings. Four, let us replace disbelief, greed, laziness, and ignorance with belief, zeal, questioning, and dedication. Five, let us turn resentment into gratitude. Six, let us turn dependency into self-reliance. Seven, let us turn reluctance to learn into willingness to learn well. Eight, let us turn reluctance to teach into willingness to teach well. Nine, let us turn lack of public spirit into eagerness to serve the good of all. have announcement to share from Kathy. Good morning. I'll use this chair. <laughs> so there's a few announcements, upcoming events and class and retreats. Um, on two weeks from now on the twenty eighth of April, Sunday we have the 109th anniversary of One Buddhism. And this, this celebrates our spiritual birthday. So on that day, we will have a talk with Venerable Jaksanam, and we'll have a, the Dharma naming ceremony. So a few, a few practitioners will get their Dharma names. So come and, um, come and support them, which will be really nice. And then we'll have music from the Wan Choir and community lunch. So the community lunch, um, if you would like to, this is the flyer, you'll see it in the foyer. The community lunch, if you would like to um, bring potluck, it's not required, but if you would like to come and bring something, there is a sign-up sheet right here. And it'll be out in the foyer. So all you have to do is put your name and say yes or no if you want to sign up. Not only for the potluck people, but anybody who wants to come yeah. to that um, <laughs> service for the head count, please sign up. That helps a lot. So then there are also two retreats as well. This is Memorial Day weekend. Your life is your practice. And this is Sky Like Mind with uh, Lama, Lama Willa. So this is in... Um, July, the weekend of July 4th. So you can get more information online for these as well. And then the last announcement is that next Sunday on the 21st, we have our Kyohadan meeting, which is if you have a Dharma name, that's where we're going to gather and we have our, our regular monthly meeting. So thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. So we have one choir. <laughs> Did you did you get that the name one choir? Do you wonder who they are? <laughs> I'm part of them. <laughs> and if you think you know, you know, I am a quite you know okay singer, you get a lot better singers you know from that one choir. So that's April twenty eighth. Thank you. Page nine. 
Let us close our circle with morning prayer song. Morning prayer song. Makaya Buddha Our local practitioners, thank you so much for joining us today. Do we have Clark today? Clark? No Clark? No Clark. <laughs> no cookies. But yes, tea. So please stop by. Yes, cookie. Yes, yes, cookie. So please, you're welcome to stop by at our dining hall and get your tea there and cookies. And our retreat participants. We are going to have our closing circle at 11.25. Thank you all. Have a great rest of your day.